for the suspenders? Somebody has suspenders on, I think. Oh, here you are. Okay. So if I understand your question, if you want to know what was the, what went on with education in the late 18th century for the era of the founders, what? No, no, today. Oh, today. today. Oh, oh, education about that. Right. Today, what did you, what, what, what thoughts do you have? It's a problem. <laughs> Look, uh, there's a guy who's endowed a chair in the history of the American Revolution. This is, to this, I think his name's Sid Lapidus, has endowed a chair on, on the history, of, to teach the history of the American Revolution. Princeton cannot fill it. There are no people, I just retired from Brown, there's nobody teaching the history of the American Revolution at Brown University. There's nobody teaching the history of the American Revolution at Harvard. They, they're teaching social history, gender, uh, race relations, there's a lot of interest, for obvious reasons. These are current problems, but unfortunately, the American Revolution is the most important event in our history, and therefore, every institution ought to be having a course in it. Uh, it's just not being taught the way it, it ought to be, and it's lamentable. Um, but, you know, even where you have an endowed chair here at Princeton, it can't be filled. Um, it's sad. I, I, I think things will change. Uh, fashions occur in history as in other things, and, but we might have to wait a generation. I, I'm, but in the meantime, and this is true uh, of, of the history that you read, most of the history written by academics, unfortunately, and, and this is different from what it was when I came of age 50 years ago, uh, is written for each other. The academics are writing monographic history. They're writing papers that are akin to the papers that physicists would write to each other. We don't expect the physicist to write a paper that's intelligible to us non-physicists. And that's what's happened with history. They're working within a discipline. They're in a conversation. They're developing the discipline. There are a lot of contributions uh, made by these um, academic historians. but. As a consequence, the history that most laymen want to read is now being written by non-academics who have no PhDs. And you can think of them. David McCullough, Walter Isaacson, uh, jo uh, John, uh, jo John Mitt, uh, Meacham, uh, uh, Richard Brookheiser. I mean, I could go on. These are all people who have no PhDs. They're writing the history that uh, the public wants to read. And there's a gap now between what the academics are doing, and they're talking to each other, and they're making real progress, but it's all monographic. And the papers that they, and the books they write are unintelligible <laughs> to, to us. And in fact, the president of the American Historical Association, Bill Cronin, uh, wrote a couple of pieces last year in, in a periodical that put out by the Historical Association, and he, he complained about this. He says, our, our stuff is not even, some of the stuff we write isn't even intelligible to each other if you're not in the field. And he, he says it's because we're boring. He's missed the point. It's not because we're, they're boring. It's because their conception of their audience is one another. And, and you, you can understand that if you, if you ever tried to read a physics paper, uh, you wouldn't understand it because they're, writing for each other, and, and that's what's happened with history. Fortunately, history is now being written, the history that we read is now being written by what I would call the real professionals, you know, the people like McCullough and, and, and so on, because they live by their pens. They don't have academic positions. They have to live, you know, there's a whole group of them, really good ones, like Ron Chernow's. His biography of George Washington is, is the best single volume biography. Uh, ever written of Washington. He's honest, he did great research, uh, it's, but he's a former journalist. 
He has no PhD. That's the situation. It's a sad, it is a bad situation. I don't have any easy answer. There's not much you can do. It's structural. It's built into the profession. It's the way, I mean, the, the young people coming along, their incent, the incentives, the way they get promoted is to, get, to continue the conversation. If they write a popular history as an assistant professor, that's probably a kiss of death for promotion. It just doesn't, that's not the way it works. You're supposed to contribute in a monographic way. It would be like a physicist, a young physicist getting started, and instead of writing for his fellow physicists, he decides to write one of these pot books about what's going on in, you know, astrophysics or something. Well, that's not going to cut much ice with his fellow physicists. If you follow what I'm saying, that's the state of academic research and history. It's very deep. It's very complicated. You saw some of that yesterday with Steve. He's a young guy. He's deeply involved in, uh, in the monographic work. And he, you know, he has students doing this and this. And he, he, he wanted to tell you about those. But, but he's, he's, he's going down right to the, to, the, to the qualifications, to the complexity, and, and, and forgetting about, about the, the obvious things. And that's the state of, of historical research. I don't see any easy answer, but we, the history is being written, and some of it's really good. Uh, you know, McCullough's book is really about, about a marriage. It's wonderfully written. It's not terribly enlightening about Adams' political theory or, or uh, some of his political life, but, but the marriage is superb. But Chernow's book on Washington, I, I would recommend that. That's by far the best book ever written about Washington. And in many respects, it's not Douglas C. Freeman's six, seven volumes, but as in a single volume, it is by far the best thing ever done. I, I don't want to cut Professor Wood off sincerely, um, particularly because you're talking about something that's quite important to, to both you and us. Um, what I, I sincerely encourage you to stay and, and answer such questions as you feel like answering. But I have to tell the audience that there are buses out there. 